So this would be part one to this whole thing. So obviously before I can start studying, I have to figure out how much time I want to devote to each class and when I want to devote that time. So you can see the highlighted ones are when my exams are and on which days. Uh, and I usually make a point to do something like this for every semester just because there there are some classes that definitely need more time than others like logic very easy class I really only need the day before and the afternoon before and physics is easily going to require the most amount of time and obviously I want to prepare for one as much as possible prior to it uh, but I also don't want to neglect other ones so that's why you know, today's Thursday but that's why for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm alternating physics with my math classes. So I don't want to devote too much time. I want to kind of um, jump around a little bit, as it were, um, so that I can, you know, make the most of the time and not not devote an entire day to to each single topic. I think that's a good way to get, like, burnt out and just fry your brain. So I like to usually just do 10, or I mean, 2, um per day. So today's Thursday, so physics, I have a lot to catch up on. So this afternoon, I'm going to devote all of my time to that. Um, in the parentheses here, that's how much time I have for that slot. I, I do all of these, um, not so much for the purposes of, of adding, adding them all up to, um, although it does help, but it's mainly so that, um, if I decide how much time I want to devote to something, so like six hours on Sunday for linear algebra, if I have to absolutely get up and leave the house and go do something or run a last minute errand that absolutely has to be done in the middle of this time slot, then I know I can come back to it and um, you know, devote however much time I need to uh, that I hadn't already done. So. You know, if, if it's in the middle of this and I only get through two hours and I don't get back to the house for and three hours later, then I know that I still need to do four hours for a total of six, if that makes sense. So for the rest of this video, I'm not going to show how I study for physics. Um, I think that's an entirely different beast than studying for math because uh, most of my physics um, tests are word problems and very few of them are even just like general conceptual problems. Um, so it's it's really hard to study for that and it, you know, translate or be beneficial to other people in, in my opinion. Um, as far as my personal studying goes, I mean, I can I can just briefly talk about it. A large portion of it would be um, just conceptual and, and reading a textbook and uh, maybe watching a tutorial or something or an explanation of a concept. Um, and I'll take notes and I don't I don't have to worry about memorizing formulas because I get several formula sheets but of course I have to know what formula is for what thing because they're not labeled they're just you know formulas on a list and they're in no particular order well they're in they're in order by chapter but that's it um, but I'm not gonna remember what chapter something is from probably I just need to be able to look at a, an equation and recognize what it's for and what can I use it for so a lot of that will be reading the textbook I'll probably go back over old homework problems old exam problems, old quiz problems, because I keep all of those in hard copies for explicitly for this. Um, and that'll be basically the extent of that. Uh, I might get some last minute tutoring from my friend who's a physics whiz, but that remains to be seen. I haven't decided about that just yet. And logic, again, is just looking back at notes, making sure I grasp topics. Most of that is just, um, you know, memorization for the most part, definitions, how to do real basic things. Um, especially when it comes to things like logic tables, it's just straight memorization. Th this whole video will be just for math. So let's jump into it. So lucky for me, I won't have a common final for uh, either of my math classes. And my professor, she, like I've mentioned before, I had the same professor for both math classes. So it's kind of good and bad. Bad because I don't like her. Good because it's you know consistent across classes as far as how she teaches and does tests. But what she's done is. She's taken test problems from old tests that we've had throughout the semester, and she's taken problem, problems from those to create the final. So obviously they won't be exactly the same, numbers will be changed, 
other small things will be changed, it'll be more or less the same, which is the same way she's done with practice tests, uh, you know, compared to real tests. So I have that going for me. And she's given us which problems we have to look at from each particular test. So what I'm going to do right now is go through all of my old tests. I have this giant binder that I've made here. I'm, I'm all about the binders. And I have in it the practice exams from the, all my math classes. Um, as well as the actual exams that I took and the correct answers to the exams that I took in addition to of course all the notes that I've taken in those classes. So right now I'm just going to go through, I'm going to um, really just take out the the um, tests with the proper answers because they're all on the same page and I'm just going to transcribe all of these problems onto my own paper and in the process of doing that there's obviously going to be some stuff from like the beginning of the semester or some stuff on a more recent test that I really didn't have a great grasp on and at that point as I come to that you know hit that roadblock and whichever one I'm working through at that point I'll look it up and um, try and figure out on YouTube or on my textbook or additional textbook that I have so let's get started I do something rather similar for um, test prep. Um, I usually just take questions and the correct answers and I'll just transcribe them several times. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned this several times in previous videos. And just like as a small note, it's more of my pet peeve than really any real purpose behind it. But when I transcribe these, I'll give each problem its own piece of paper or one side specifically. It's mainly just because I don't like have to flip it front and back to a piece of paper and I also do math and pen and it bleeds a little bit and it's kind of distracting sometimes but I like to just be able to look at one side of a piece of paper and flip back and forth really quickly if need be I don't like having to flip front and back and I just I want to have an entire problem on one page so that I'm not looking at that and then maybe getting confused with something farther down the line I just piece of paper for each problem again that's more my pet peeve than really anything else Additionally, I'll write the like a general form of the question on this when I transcribe it so I, after I do that, I don't have to look back at the actual test and I can know what I'm actually doing because that's a, a big problem for me. If I just look at some work, I might not know exactly what it's for um, and I don't want to have to go back and forth between the tests and what I'm writing on and all that stuff. So I'll usually write either the whole thing or if I can, I'll just write like an abbreviated version. So in this case, I'm doing linear algebra. The first problem was um, for an aug augmented matrix of a system of equations, A, find row echelon, row echelon form and reduce row echelon form, and B, list the free, bar free variables, and C, find all solutions. So I'll just go ahead and write that on there. So obviously when it comes to anyone who's tried to row reduce something or find some form of a matrix, there's more than one way to do it with row operations and obviously some people are better at it than others and they compile steps, they, they um, do two steps at a time on a matrix and they just annotate it differently. But generally speaking, I'll probably just go with what she has on here just because she's probably you know, thought about it in advance and it's probably the most succinct possible way to get a relatively large matrix, which in this case is a three by five into row echelon form and reduce row echelon form. So otherwise that would probably take me a while and I know that that's something I'm going to have to practice. Not just because it's difficult per se, but it's really tedious. It's not always obvious how to, how to do your row operations and it's definitely, I think, something that requires practice in order to get really proficient at so you can just fly through it because otherwise that can be something that's really time consuming. I have two and a half hours to do 10 to 12 problems so let's average that let's say 11. So two and a half hours divided by 11 gives you 0.22 hours so a tenth of an hour would be six minutes so about 12 to 13 minutes per problem. That's a little bit more time than I usually get on a regular test which is like eight to nine minutes per problem, which sucks because I, I do math slowly. I'm not good at fast math. That's when I start making like minor algebraic errors and just obvious glaring mistakes and where I should know better. So I'm glad to have a little more time per problem, but in a perfect world, I would have an hour to do each problem. But that's just me being a bad test taker and that's something I need to 
you know, work through and eventually get over, hopefully. Oftentimes I'll come to something that involves like a real something real particular. So in this case, finding row echelon form versus redo row echelon form. And I can't remember the, the specific definitions for those with 100% certainty. Cause it's been so long since I've thought about those. So usually I'll go over to my whiteboard on the wall. In this case, I'll probably split it up into half and half, one side for Calc 3, one side for linear algebra. And in this case, I'll probably write down to start with the difference between row echelon form and reduce row echelon form, just to kind of like ingrain it in my mind, because there will be some question that asks for one form over the other, and that'll be the end of me for that problem. So that's the first one done. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine more to go. Well, now that I've finally finished doing that, um, it's time to write some definitions on the whiteboard. Some of them I'll be able to just immediately write from memory and some of them I'll have to look up. Try to write as many from memory as I possibly can, just to exercise that muscle a little bit. And then at that point I'll just use it for reference. Um, for some of the longer ones I might make some flashcards or some note cards, because there's just a lot to remember, especially when it comes to like uh, row spaces and null spaces and their complements and their inverses and all of their relationships with each other. It can get really confusing really fast. I think the only way to do that is just sit down and grind it out basically. So luckily for the most part, I was able to do most of them by heart, which is nice. Uh, one I definitely don't know by heart is, like I said, all of the uh, identities and relationships between row spaces and null spaces and column spaces and their complements and their inverses and stuff, which can't hold it against me because I don't know anyone who knows all that stuff like really well. So at this point, I'll uh, I won't. I won't tonight because my my time allocation for tonight is up for this class and I'm about to start studying for physics, but uh, when I go to study for this class again, I'll go through uh, my exams again. I'll try not to look at the solutions and I'll try and do it myself. Um, then if I get stuck, then I'll look at the solutions and I'll continue to watch tutorials and explanations online and refer to my textbook as needed. And then once I feel reasonably comfortable with the exam problems, you have to consider the fact that there's different versions of some things. So for example, if you want to talk about linear transformations, you can have polynomials, you can have functions, you can just have, you know, scalar quantities and stuff like that. So there's, for a lot of this stuff, there's um, like more than one form of it. The, the difference between them is enough to trip you up if you're not familiar with all of them. So I'll look up some example problems or do old homework and stuff and I'll work through those and do the same thing all over again. So thanks for watching. I hope this was of some help or benefit to you. Um, all of this was in preparation for my linear algebra final. Um, I'm considering making a video for uh, preparing for my calculus 3 final as well but the video for that would be extremely similar so I don't know if that would be of any help and really are just superfluous, you know. Uh, but anyhow, like I said, thanks for watching. Hopefully it was uh, beneficial to you. Uh, see you next time.